Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we gather in God's house. And we just ask the Lord to just bless us today. Some of us come burdened. Burdened with the problems of the week. Maybe with some health issues. Some come with heavy hearts. We ask the Lord to just speak to us where we are today. And we know the Lord does. And we know the Lord will. So welcome to our guests in the Lord's house today. Um, Luendo, is that right? Linda's sister is up. Little sister, is that right, Linda? From Zambia. I think you get the award for the longest travel to get here this morning. And welcome to our guests who are on the live stream. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. How wonderful you are. That you have so loved us, that you have made yourself known. You not only, you not only created us in all things, but you redeemed us through the blood of your son. And so we are welcomed into your presence today, not because we are good, but because you are our loving and true. And thank you, Lord, for your spirit that abides with us, for your word that, that comes to us. May we receive it with grateful hearts. May you kindle in us the fire of your love and, Lord, a faith that trusts you solely. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our service today will take us to the shores of Galilee, and so we'll, we'll be focusing in on Luke 5, but we'll sing our first hymn, uh, God Himself is Present, Let's Rise to Sing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. 
If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore we are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, in word and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children. And you gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may be ever defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord lifted up on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and, whom, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 12 through 20. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, 
one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in a position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be given, giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. This is the word of the Lord. Let's join in singing the hymn, Holy, 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 verses 1, 3, and 4. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. He asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, 
they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father. You may be seated. We invite the children to come forward for the children's message. We'll see who all we get. Okay. Boys and girls, I have a confession to make. First of all, you need to see me. I know that's scary, but just give me your best shot. You see, I've got three services that have been floating in my mind this weekend. So this morning I thought, oh boy, I need to have something for the kids. And so I thought, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then I thought about the lesson of what's behind the altar this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand up because I want to show you something. I want you to see these flowers. The Jarvis family brought these flowers in for the memorial for their mom yesterday. They're orchids. Come on up. You can come right up in here. That's okay. But they're beautiful and they're large. I want you to look at the stems and what they had to do to keep these large flowers. You see this stem, but do you see this little rod? Why do you think they put it there? Why do you think they put it there? Yes? To hold the flowers up because that's a lot of weight, isn't it? As you look at that rod, what does it almost look like? Imagine if these were fish. Could it look like a fishing rod? I know it's imagination. Walk with me, okay? You can have a seat. How many of you have somebody in your family that likes to go fishing? Oh, man. Who likes to go fishing in your family? Ben, you can have a seat. Everybody. Everybody likes to go fishing. Does Grandpa have fishing rods? Which rods? Well, the Grandpa right behind you. Oh, yeah, he has fishing rods. He has... Okay, so he has halibut rods. He probably has salmon rods. Does he have trout rods? What? Trout? The littler fish? Um, I have one. 
You have one. And you use them for bullhead. Ben, we can talk fishing all day. I love that. But I want you to imagine, Grandpa says, Ben, I need to borrow your rod. I'm going to go sturgeon fishing with your trout rod. How would that work? Right. What would happen to your rod? It would snap right off. You get a six-foot halibut on a trout rod, it's, it's toast, right? It ain't going to work. Well, you know, in the story today, Peter's fishing. And they have nets for shallow fishing at night. They're big, they're clunky, they have a certain payload, and Jesus has overloaded that net. So much so, it's starting to break. So much so, it's not only going to fill his boat till it sinks, it's going to fill his neighbor's boat till it sinks. And remember, Jesus sent him out to deep water. Now, if you're in deep water with a boat that's sinking, would that help your prayer life? It helped my prayer life. But you see, Peter, he prays not for his life. He prays not a thanksgiving for the fish. He prays for forgiveness. Actually, he says, depart from me, because I'm a sinful guy. There was something Jesus had that was more valuable than fish. It was forgiveness. It was the remedy for sin. And Jesus came to give that to Peter too. Peter had been listening when Jesus taught. And he knew that Jesus had the words of everlasting life. I don't know about you. I guess about you. But I know about me. I need those words. I need Jesus. Because you know what? My last name is Herring. Do you know what a herring is? <laughs> it's a fish. But it's a little fish. Do I fit my name? Am I a little fish? No, I'm a big fish. But you know what my little boy did? You met Ezra. We were out at the beach, and he saw all those seals. He said, Dad, do seals eat herring? He wasn't worried about the little fish. He was worried about him. But you see, he was okay. And we're okay. Because Jesus is looking out for us. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you met Peter in an amazing way. We thank you for the catch of fish, but the greatest catch of all is the people you bring into your boat, the church. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you didn't throw us back, that we are keepers in your kingdom because of your son, Jesus Christ. So help us to rejoice in your goodness and to follow after you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I have some treats. You can have treats and we'll get ready to sing our sermon song.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our meditation today is continuing in a series through the Gospel of Luke. And today we're in Luke chapter 5. And I told some people yesterday I'm going to start with a quiz. Now if you know the answer, raise your hand, but don't blurt it out, okay? I have a mystery fish for you to see. What kind of fish is this? If you know the answer, raise your hand. The one I told about, she's puzzled, I can tell. Does, you don't have to answer. If you know, raise your hand. Okay. I was hoping that would be it. Did somebody raise their hand? Okay, I'll ask you in a little bit. We'll see if we got it right. You're, you're my fishing expert here. But many of you may not know it because it's not native to the Northwest. This is an invasive species caught on the Columbia River. In fact, it is not a popular fish among the Northwest because it eats a whole lot of salmon smolts. I tell you, I fished for this once with my friend Phil Matson. He grew up in Minnesota fishing for this fish with his dad. He's now a professional guide, and he guides people to catch all kinds of fish. But this fish is his specialty. They have razor-sharp teeth, a dorsal fin like a hypodermic needle that will puncture your skin, and razor-sharp gills you don't put your fingers in there. They are a challenge to catch. They are a challenge to clean. And they are a delicacy, highly sought after, for those who know what they are. In fact, in the Midwest, they are about the favorite fish. It's a walleye. A walleye. You can tell it by their eyes, kind of buggy eyed. The Canadians call them pickerel, and they're delicious. Well, today we're going fishing with Jesus. We're going to watch closely every move that he makes because we're going to see, and the theme for today is to be caught up in Christ. We're going to look at the context of this miracle, the conflict that it it ensues, and the calling and connection Jesus gives. First, the context. I'm going to stop. Did you get it right, Walleye? He got it right. Okay. Jesus is taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. He drove out a demon. He went to Simon Peter's house. He drove out a fever from Peter's mother-in-law. He goes to a deserted place, Jesus does. And people are flocking to him. And they're begging that he will stay. You stay right here, Jesus. We need a guy like you in this place. But this is what Jesus says to them. He says... Skip the slide. We're good. I took it out. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus was sent for a purpose. He says, I must preach to the other towns. The father had had an agenda for him to follow. He couldn't linger in one place too long. He had other people to see. He had other miracles to do. He had other sermons to preach. He wanted everybody to hear the word of God and to see that the word of God was fulfilled in him. And so we get to Luke 5 and it says on one occasion, there's many occasions, but this is the one that Luke is sharing. He says, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, But, um, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and they were washing their nets. And then in verse three, it says, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked them, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. So far, I have a feeling Simon Peter feels pretty comfortable. He's familiar with Jesus. He's honored to help with the mission. He's being of service. He's using his boat. 
He gets a front row seat. And he listens. And Jesus is teaching. And thousands of people are there. They were so pressing in on him. Jesus couldn't back up any farther. So he goes out in the water in a boat. And he teaches. And I have a feeling Peter's pretty happy. But something profound is about to happen to Peter. It's life changing. It's going to shock him. It's going to undo him. Because Jesus sends him out fishing in the light of day. But these were shallow water nets. They were thick. They were clumsy. And they were effective only at night in the darkness when the fish couldn't see these nets being cast upon them. Peter knew fishing. They had fished all night and their nets were empty. With a, They were at the right time in the right place, but they didn't get the right result they were looking for. So Peter protests before he obeys. But what does he say? This is what he says. But at your word, I will let down the nets. You know what happens. The nets are so filled with large fish that they begin to break. Peter signals for help from the other boats, his good partners, uh, James and John. And they come and they so fill these boats that they start to sink. And now they're out in the deep water. And all those who were in the boats, it says, were amazed and shocked at the miraculous catch of fish. That's the context. Think about the conflict. Verse 8 says, But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me. There's a conflict going on in Peter. What has happened? The same thing that happened in the calling of Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 6. When a person comes into the presence of a holy God, there is an undoing. There's a painful reality. There is, there is something that cuts deep within the person. Rudolf Otto wrote a book. It was entitled The Idea of the Holy. He says, when you, when you draw near to a supreme deity, you are ripped apart and completely by completely opposing strong and passionate responses to the holy. He says you can see this when you, when you watch how people relate to somebody who is magnificently intelligent or, or breathtakingly beautiful or superiorly powerful. And, and they come into the presence of this kind of a person and, and they both are drawn to them and they're a little bit repulsed because they don't feel worthy to be in that kind of presence. And they're fearful. Rudolf Otto says, you're attracted and you're repulsed. You're fascinated and you're frightened all at the same time. And do you know why? He says there's two sides to the same reason. That's the problem with the human condition. You can't live with God. You can't live without God. We may hate the whole idea of a holy God, a just God who will judge. And at the same time, we desperately need him. And we are drawn to him. So the first thing that we're taught here is that when you get drawn to the real God, you will experience a conflict, a conflict inside. You'll get near the real God. And, and God is like a storm in the lake, he says. It, it always stirs up the junk on the bottom. And when you get near to God, there's a conflict because he's going to stir up the junk in the bottom of your heart. And you will see yourself or who you really are. And you'll wrestle with that. Look at, at Jesus as he, as he calls out or, um, to Isaiah. He says, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And for Peter, he says, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Two boats are sinking with an amazing catch of fish. Uh, a catch that was of Peter's dreams. He wouldn't have even dreamed a dream this big. But it didn't matter anymore. Where Peter was with his Lord is all that mattered to him. So don't you see the conflict was necessary because Jesus wasn't after walleye. Jesus had the catch of the day in mind and it was Peter and it was the people in the boat with him. 
Jesus had cast the net of his word out for them. He had a captive audience. Jesus could fill an empty net designed for the darkness, designed for the shallows, and now bursting to overflowing out of the deep, and it was in the light of day. Peter thought, you don't know what you're getting, Lord, with me. I'm messed up. I have messed up. I'm like catching a bug-eyed walleye when you're after Chinook. When you're after a trophy, Lord, I don't feel like a trophy. But you see, God works with messed up people. God works through messed up people. But God, he does things we don't always see coming. He knew exactly who Peter was and loved him completely. His confession was an expression of his need, and so is ours. Sometimes uh, I pray a lot, but sometimes I neglect the confession part of my prayer life. And that's not good. It's too easy to start neglecting the things and covering up things in my heart and in my mind, the things that I'm not doing that I ought to be doing. And it's not good because I need forgiveness. I need grace. Just like everyone else. I need the Lord. Every moment of every day. So you see, confession brings a closeness that I don't have to hide or pretend I can be real about my struggles with the one who knows already and loves me completely. And he can help me. He can restore me. He will free me. He has forgiven me. You see, sometimes people think, well, I just need to go to church more. Or I just need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. I need to be more religious. Maybe I need to serve more to soothe the hurt inside. Maybe I'll right some of the wrongs and I'll try better and I'll feel better and I'll do better. But getting near to God is sometimes more painful than staying far away. That's some of what I learned as I studied the text. Because you see, getting near can expose us and and we begin to wrestle with the conflict within us and And it gets more intense the more we get around the word of God. And it doesn't necessarily bring peace in itself. You see, it's not in getting near to God. But getting into God. That brings peace. Getting into Christ. For Paul writes this in Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified with Christ. I've been joined with Christ. I've been baptized into Christ. That's my identity. He's gifted me with the Holy Spirit. He's brought me to faith. He's declared me to be a child of God. That's where my standing is. And all the other things, the Bible reading, the praying, the coming to church is an expression of who I am. It doesn't create me to be something I'm not. God uses that in powerful ways. But it's all about being in Christ. In fellowship with our God. You see... Jesus gave himself for you and me. That's what brings peace in the presence of a holy God. We're not saved because we're good or because there's righteous things we've done, but only by his mercy. Jesus went through all that on the cross in our place. He died that we can live. He rose again to give us life, new life. And you see, Peter makes his confession. And what does Jesus do? He invites Peter to follow him. This is what the text says. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, 
left everything and followed him. And it says when you will fish for people, it says you will fish and bring life. Most of the fish we catch, they die because they're going to be on our plate. But when you fish for people, you bring them life, not from us, but from the Lord. The life he came to give and bring. And so now I want you to look at Peter again, but this is a little bit different. It was a different fishing trip. And we're going to close with this. It's in John 21, and it's after the resurrection. The disciples have seen the resurrected Lord only twice. But Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the other guys, they were probably feeling stir crazy. They were supposed to wait on the Holy Spirit. So he says, we're going fishing too. And they fished all night. Same lake, same probably location, though we don't know for sure. But it's a foggy morning, kind of like this one. And at a distance on the shore, they see somebody making breakfast. And probably they're getting a stir in their tummy that I'm hungry too. And they can't make out who it is, but he cries out to them. He says, children, have you caught any fish? And they probably just groan and said, no. One thing I know about fishermen, they never want to admit they haven't caught a thing. But that's what they said. And he says to them, he says, cast your net out on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. And they do. So many fish are in that net, it starts to break. And John, the beloved disciple, he says, it is the Lord. And this time Peter responds. He doesn't want to push Jesus away. He puts on his coat. He jumps in the water. Doesn't matter what's in the net. He wants to go see Jesus. And he swims like he's Michael Phelps. And he gets to that shoreline and he sits by Jesus. The rest, they come and they bring him in. Jesus already cooked the fish. He already had bread. He had breakfast ready for them. Then the time comes, he starts to talk to Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's bothered by the question, but he says, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Three times Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter responds, and three times Jesus said, Feed my people. What was Jesus doing? I have a feeling Peter is so much different because he's denied the Lord three times. He's carrying a weight of guilt. And rather than wanting to run from Jesus, he runs to him. Because he's seen the cross. He's seen the empty tomb. He knows what Jesus did for him. And Jesus is speaking forgiveness and saying, Peter... You're still my man. You're important to me. You're valuable in my kingdom. Peter, you're a keeper. And as the Lord looks at you this morning, as he looks at me, because of the accomplished work of Jesus, we are all keepers. We are all those that God sends out, casts out into this world with good news to share with lost and hurting people. But Jesus came for them too. And he died and rose again that we might be his forever. Friends in Christ, that's the good news. I want to share with you this morning. D.A. Carson says, one cannot enter the holy and glorious presence of God, nor can one hear the word of Jesus in all its grace and truth without being convicted of one's utter ungodliness. The source of the catch depends on the will of Jesus, on grace. Grace precedes repentance. Recognition of guilt and unworthiness does not drive one from God. It drives one to God. That's the paradox of grace. Jesus draws near to us so that like Peter, we can drop our defenses. We can yield to his transforming grace and forgiveness. 
Peter and his partners, they leave everything behind. They follow him. And that's the calling of connection God has for us, has for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Now I have a song of response for you. It's the last two verses of the last hymn. And if it's new to you, it's a newer hymn, but it's a very familiar tune. And I want you to think about the things we're praying and singing as we sing. Let's rise. seated you can probably see it's offering time and our lives are an offering that's why we split it up that way so we bring to the Lord our offerings We now bring the Lord our prayers, but I'm going to ask for prayer requests, and Lisa's going to write them down for me. You guys have been wonderful about prayer requests. So I want to add Rand, Cheryl Stapleton's father, who passed away about two days ago. We've been praying for Rand. The Lord has called him home. And then we'd like to pray for your family today um, as we have the celebration of life for Dick Jr. Is that okay? And then for the Jarvises and the Goodbroads who've also had some losses. And we'll pray for the little babies that are newborn and just so little. And other prayer requests this morning, please. Ben. Say that again. 
yes, we're going to pray for, for your whole family today and about uh, Uncle Dick. Please, Isaac. Cousin Anne, whose aunt, sister died. Aunt, whose sister died. Okay. And how's Daryl doing? We were praying for him. Okay. So Daryl and uncle and the sister's aunt. Aunt's sister died. Thank you, Isaac. What's the first name? Shauna. Shauna. We'll pray. Thank you uh, for Shauna. Other prayer requests. Bev. Yes, Marge Gubrod's brother passed. Mike. I think it's Mike. We'll call him Mike. The Lord knows, right? Okay. Yes, and we're going to pray for Carol Andreessen, who's undergoing cancer therapy. Any others? There were four high school kids. Yes, Dan, go ahead. For your grandson? Yes. For little Boaz Augustus. Frost. Okay. And four high school kids were in an auto accident, and we'll pray for them too. Thank you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the God of all comfort, that you have provided for us so richly in your Son that you allowed him to suffer in our place for all the things that have stricken us, our own sinfulness, the fallenness of this world, the attacks of, of Satan, O oh Lord. He, he bore them all for us so that we are now more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we pray for Dick Jr.'s family as they say their farewells today. Lord, you know the, the painfulness of a loss as you watch your son pass. And yet by his passing, oh Lord, he's given hope. Hope beyond the grave, the resurrection that he came to bring. So Lord, comfort them. We pray also the Jarvis family, the Goodbrod family, in, in the passing of Rocky and now Marge's brother, Mike. We pray, oh Lord, that you would comfort them with the resurrection hope, with the good news of Easter morning. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for all the little ones, the babies um, that are still being carried and the ones that have been born. We pray a prayer of thanksgiving for Boaz Augustus, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you bless this little boy, that he might know the fullness of your love, the abundance of your grace, your calling on his life, Bless his parents, too, as they learn this new role you have given them as Boaz, his mom and dad. And Lord, we pray for Stacy, whose aunt, uh, aunt's sister passed away. We pray for Shauna that you would comfort her in this time. Also bless her Uncle Daryl with healing, we pray. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, watch over Carol and Dreesen, who's with us today. Lord, um, help her through this cancer therapy. Be her strength and her great reward. May your hand of healing rest upon her. And Lord, continue to heal those that um, uh, are wounded, especially when we think of those four high school kids in a rollover accident this week. Heal them, O oh Lord, and watch over and protect them. We thank you that no serious injury that we know of occurred. Watch over all the kids, we pray. Help them through each day. These last two years have been very hard on teachers and families and kids. Be their strength and stay. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for all your faithfulness, for calling us as your own, for that word of God that's authoritative, that's powerful, uh, the words of life, as Peter said. May they continue to reign in our hearts and in our ears and in our lives as you work in us, your good and pleasing will. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray together the prayer you have taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We'd invite you to rise and we'll join in the service of the word. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father. Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. And because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns through all eternity, All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and have given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. As the glory of your presence once filled the ancient temple, so in the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, you manifested the fullness of your glory in human flesh. We give you thanks that in this his most holy supper, you reveal your glory to us. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood so that we may one day behold your glory face to face. Amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the same night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated. As we sing, I know we don't often do a distribution hymn, but there's one that just helps us get our minds focused, and it's Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, and come for all is ready. Um, We do have the common cup, but it's for tincture. So if you want to take your wafer and put it in and get your wine that way, you're welcome to do that. Also, we have the individual cups. Come for all is ready. Take and eat the body of Christ given unto death for you. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for you. Now this holy body and precious blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen.
Now this holy body and this precious blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting, departing with peace and with his joy. Amen. We pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all the saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We invite, I think, Dan Ford, is that right? And uh, he's taken, stepping in for Dale today. And he'll be our elder with announcements. Today at 2.30 p.m., uh, there will be a celebration of life for Dick Jordan Jr. in the fellowship hall. Um, Next uh, Saturday, the Fellowship Hall is reserved all day. Next Sunday, uh, we have Sunday School for All Ages at 9.10 a.m. and worship service following at 10.30. Are there any other announcements? Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for those who joined us in the live stream. We encourage you and want to thank you. Uh, there's a lot of ministry flowing right now and many hands have really helped. I want to thank Sam and Linda and um, Hal. They put in some AV equipment in the fellowship hall that we'll use today for the celebration of life. And so um, if you haven't seen it, we invite you to check it out and it'll be very, very helpful. We use it for Bible class too. Have a blessed week. Um, if you need anything, let us know, and we will be lifting each other up in prayer. Let's rise for our closing hymn. Is, yes? Oh, please. I, I just wanted to introduce her. Absolutely. <laughs> Say that one more time. She Haru Wessel. Okay. She looks like she. Okay. She came to church with us when she lived with us. So it's been a long time since she's been here. She lives in Maryland. Wow, you have come a long ways. Not far, far as it Zambia, but that's pretty far. <laughs> and it's like, uh, well, welcome. It is an honor to have you. Polly, good to see you. Um, you are all just a delight to the eyes. So may God bless you. We'll sing this uh, last hymn. Let's sing verses 1 and 4. 1 and 4. Uh, hark the voice of Jesus calling 826.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Have a wonderful week.